to A. This is why I don't even like to use red. See that? That's so. Is that a fancy cue? That's pretty cool. So Fort Duquesne. And Fort Duquesne, wooden stockade, Washington didn't know. He also knew that the Indians had Huron allies were watching them all the way. Did I talk at all about Huron's hair? I didn't. How did the Hurons wear their hair? During World War II, American paratroopers, they were going to use these Okay, in the 1800s, they started calling them guerrilla tactics. Before that, they called them Indian tactics. And they wanted to use those. The idea is that paratroopers were dropping on enemy lines. And the idea would be that they wouldn't attack big units, but they would hit and run and ambush. Makes sense for, so you heard of guerrilla. But they called it Indian tactics. And this goes back to the 1750s and a guy named George Roger Clark. We'll talk about him later. But they wanted to act like they were American Indians. And so that's why they would jump and yell Geronimo. Jumping out of a plane because that was a that was a name they knew, Apache chief, and they started cutting their hair as what they thought they were American Indians. So they started their training in New York near a tiny little reservation of the Mohawks. They called this haircut the Mohawks. This is World War II, 42. So when you hear the name Mohawk, what do you think? What is it? Right? Mohawks didn't wear their hair like that. Here on. So people say that's a Mohawk. No, it's not. Even though all the moths wore their hair. Oh, this is perfect. You're going to like this. So, you want to know? No hair here. And how do they do that? Well, you have to prove you're tough enough to be a man. So, this will hurt you, but not us. So, with this, they would grab a big hunk of this hair and rip it out. And so basically, would take the skin all the way to the skull. So there would be nothing but a, you know, basically a star here. Ready? That's actually what we're going to do in the assembly. Um, Everybody over the age of 13 is going to get that haircut. Um, I'm not actually the whole issue. Okay, with that. <laughs> so that's how the whole hot there. And so if you're ever going to move in, they show me you know, very carefully shaved. No. So if you want to get a haircut next time, you really want a mohawk. Yeah. Be tough. Do it. See, but yeah, it's perfect limit. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? You know, it's best we go into stocks first. Okay, with that. Okay. So then I get some leverage. Whoa, whoa, wait, wait. What? What could they have been? Huh? That could have been an assassin, people. <laughs> Didn't we talk about this? Okay, Megan, get out of here. Kick me out. I need you're gonna help me. So, as we all know, everybody in this school is out to get me. Right? I'm not paranoid. I just know it's true. And so they could have been assassins, and I could be sort of teaching my butt off you. And that's you know there's a pitch for that. Right? So you must alert me when somebody comes in. Huh? That's what assassins use. Read history. So you're gonna act like a stranger coming in, okay? Walk in and you must all alert me of a potential assassin by screaming out assassin. <laughs> so when anybody walks in this room that we don't know, and really the only one that we're pretty sure will not be the assassin will be me. <laughs> You might yell assassin, so come in. Assassin! Wait, now, come on! All right, oh, okay, that was pretty good. Now, let's go back one more time. Let's say it's even a big one, right? It's an administrator. So let's say it's Mr. Santa. Then, we have a, this is dumb, you're in danger now, too, right? So, you must yell assassin, and then, what must you do? Well, the Hide under your desk. Exactly. <laughs> so let's try it, everybody. Come on. Hey, I'm doing it for your safety. <laughs> so you're ready? Now you're Mr. Zappa. Come in. 
Sassy. Wow. Very good. Under All right, everyone good? Okay, now everyone knows what we're doing, right? So, let's happen. Is everyone good now? All right. Do we need more practice? Who has a whistle? I was impressed. Well done. Well done. So, we'll work on this. Last year, uh, it was a fourth period, but we had an administrator. Or heck, we had a superintendent, some people from the community, and somebody from the independent record company. And I was so proud of my class for the other class in England. And they just literally went, <laughs> awesome. Another good thing to do if an administrator comes in, we all start looking at someone at random and start chanting stocks. Stocks. We put it in the stocks. <laughs> like that's a normal thing we do in class. So, see, you gotta think of these things. All right, so we're working. Once again, this is the AP class. So, what is Washington going to do? All Washington wants to be is the richest man in the call. <laughs> he wants to be a British officer and a country gentleman. Get that land in the state like an English country gentleman. And so he's going to try to speculate the land and they're the French already people. So what do you do? I just realized all that was filmed. But what do you do? <laughs> what do you do? And so... He panicked, and he started patrolling around the fort, and going north from the fort was a small party, basically just delivering mail, and going to pick up supplies. Some soldiers, a few civilians, a few Huron were going north of the fort, so some French soldiers, basically going towards Lake Erie, the idea of being on the water, the capital is Quebec. Washington decided to attack them, starting a war. And if you imagine, it's August, it's just as the sun's going down, so it's really kind of gloomy, it's really heavily forested, mountains, huge boulders everywhere, and Washington's men ambushed this party who had no idea. Killed a couple and took him prisoner. And then here's the big thing. Now what? He got great, I got him prisoner. And what actually Washington really blundered. And here's the thing. Washington had to interrogate. Now, the bell's about ready to ring, but I tell you about Washington's education. I did. Did I? His education, did I tell you? No, I, I was, it was about the bell was about ready to ring when I started talking about Washington. <laughs> okay, I knew what I was thinking. You should too. You guys rattled me. So. Washington always wanted to be an English gentleman. So I didn't talk about the classical education. I should have. Now, he had a good education. He was a, he knew how to survey land, which is a very important skill. Think how important that would be if you want to speculate. He could pick out his own land. But classical English education meant you read the classics like Roman and Greek literature, and you spoke the language of culture. And because of the of Louis the Fourteenth, it was French, and Washington did not have that education, but he wanted people to believe he did. Washington's greatest fault was he could never admit his own mistakes or his, his own liabilities. He just couldn't do it. So he's acting like he knew. So just imagine we have Washington there. They captured the French, including a French lieutenant by the name of Jumonville, and he's trying to interrogate him. So Jumonville is tied up. And it's just that pretty chaotic, kind of scary scene. Everyone's all geared up. Sun is now going down, so it's really pretty dark and lots of shadows all over. So you can't really see. Schumannville's hands are tied behind his back. Washington is standing over him. Oh, what's the problem? He doesn't know this well. And what do you do? I mean, this is a really common thing that happens. Somebody doesn't understand you. So what do you do? You repeat it. How? Slow and loud. <laughs> So he's watching this yelling, how many men are in the fort? And Jumon Mill screaming back in French. <laughs> and this is going back and forth. And Washington's getting frustrated. People are walking around just upset. Well, two scenario Indians, so we're North Carolina, Virginia border. He was half king, a warrior, one of the leaders of the warriors. He's watching this and he's just disgusted. Now he's dressed the way they fight in summer. He basically just has like a loincloth on. 
But you think about it, tan, you know, and that's pretty good camouflage. It kind of blends into everything. But he's standing there watching this. He has a war club. So imagine it's a rod, wooden rod about that thick, big, thick, heavy, and then tied at the end is a polished stone tied to it. So about this long, and so it's heavy, a heck of a weapon. And Half King is watching this just getting disgusted. Finish this thing, it's over. And he decided to end the argument. So you will be human bill. I don't like this. <laughs> it's okay for the rest of us though. And he's yelling, no one has any idea. Half King literally out of the gloom. You notice I have nothing, but you still swim. <laughs> Watch it, turn around, you're being <laughs> walked up. No warning, nothing. Not even, you know, like, hey, hey, look out. No, nothing. Walked up and bang, right there. Split his skull wide open. Oh. Blood just oh. covered Washington. And Jumanville collapsed. That was fatal. <laughs> and you can imagine everyone's like, ah, running around. And then Hacking puts his foot on a broken pit of skull, rips it open. Pulls out the brain Ew. and begins to wash himself. With what the what? <laughs> and some of the third period suggested I was like a loofah. And I thought that's actually pretty clever and, <laughs> and totally gross. But <laughs> and you can imagine you can just ah, is running around and a bunch of the French escape. And they went back to Duquesne and Washington realized, oh crap, did I screw up? I screwed up so bad. And they're going to be pouring down on me while I'm going to be slaughtered. So he does the only thing he knows what to do. They go to this little gully so they can get to the top of it and cut down trees and roll them down to the bottom of this little valley and build a quick fort. And you know you're in trouble when you call your fort. That's where you get fort necessity. And thus, we have necessity right nearby. The French quickly surround it. The French quickly surround necessity. They have it there, archaeological digs have discovered basically where the foundation is. So where that spot is, they have reconstructed the fort. Basically a couple of like little buildings equipped for, so they could shelter than a short stockade. There was a sharp fight, and they started taking casualties. What is a casualty? What's that? Say it louder again. No, actually, in war it could happen. But they didn't intend for it. Well, the enemy did. <laughs> but you know what I mean? You know, they didn't want it to. But it's also killed, it's also wounded. Casually, someone is wounded or missing. Either they deserted, which happens all the time, or they, they were captured. But a casualty is someone who can't fight anymore. They start taking casualties, so killed, wounded. And Washington has a big choice. He surrenders and loses everything he wants. Or he fights to the death, and he certainly won't be an English officer there. So he surrendered. Now, the way they surrendered back then, they rarely fought to the finish. They would give terms or conditions. Basically, we'll agree to quit fighting, you guys win, but they would say, Corollas, let us just walk home. And you know, it's better than fighting to the death. And those are called conditions. No conditions is unconditional surrender. You just got to surrender. The reason I mentioned in the, mentioning that it would become big in the Civil War and then become an incredibly important part of World War II. Very important part. So Washington surrendered. And the French wrote this out. Long, elaborate thing. And Washington took it, read it, did one, well, actually, let me rephrase that, did one of these. Signed it, get it back. What's the problem? He had no idea what he signed. So not only did he sign this little parole, agree to go back, he also admitted that he purposely ordered the murder of a French ambassador that was on a mission. Now, by no means was Jumanville a, 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 a diplomatic mission, but he admitted it. The French were looking for a way to have a sharp, quick victory in the New World to hold on to New France. Because what was happening to the population between the English, the British colonies, and the French colonies? Do you remember that? Yeah. It was um, rising a bunch, the British population was, because um, 
Because it's just they influence more people to come. A lot more people came. Exactly right. And they knew the French would be outnumbered. Ten to one. And they could see it getting bigger and bigger as more Englishmen are coming to the colonies. So the French wanted a war. That would be the excuse for the French and Indian War. Now, Washington, his blundering would be that excuse, but it was going to happen somewhere. It just kind of ironic, isn't it, that it's George Washington would be the one that would happen. He would go back. Now, the next year, the British would send regular forces to try to take Fort Duquesne under one of their best generals by the name of Braddock. General Braddock in 1755. And the reason we're mentioning him, because it showed the problem that the British were having. When Braddock marched through the woods, well, actually, he needed somebody that knew the way. Washington got a second chance to try to get his career going. Washington led the militia. It was about 700 regular British soldiers, the first regular British regiment that fought us in all of these wars in the New World, or at least in that part of the New World. And about 500 colonial militia. Washington was his second in command, technically, but Braddock looked at these colonials and thought, you guys are idiots. We kicked you out of our country for a reason. We're so much smarter than you. A real prejudice against the colonials. So Braddock refused to listen. And there were a number of problems that Braddock did not understand because he thought he knew better. In Europe, the style of fighting, he was an expert from the previous war, the War of Austrian Secession. Is they would, I'm going to give you a very generic version of how they fought in the 18th century. You would have a line basically two deep, so you have one man far in between, or you know, kind of staggered, and they would uh, line up about 30 yards from the enemy, 30 to 50 yards, and they would literally blaze away at each other's face. The weapons were so inaccurate, the idea was we need them all firing at once, and also it's easier, easier to control. And then when the enemy started to waver, they would turn their muskets into a pike, a long pole. Meaning, what would they fix? What would they fix? They would fix bayonets. You know what a bayonet is. Back then, a bayonet was, just imagine a steel or iron spear, and it's about that long. So you add that to a, to a nearly five-foot rifle, you got a pretty long pike, don't you? And they would charge with that. You can't really fire your musket when it's on, because of the way they did it, how hard it was to fire weapons. That's basically it. We need open fields. Oh, sure, cultivated Europe, yeah. Washington tried to tell Braddock, you can't fight like that in the Americas. There's these mountains, there's trees, you won't get organized. And to control armies that big, especially in a smoky battlefield, this black powder is so smoky, that's why the British would wear, you see it up there, there's a red coat, red tunics. Sometimes they'd be white underneath, some have never been green too, but mostly red. And every country had their own color they would wear, like a lot of the, in the Austrians were green, that kind of thing. And the red, so they could see them. You even know why they picked red? For the blood moon show? Hmm? For the blood moon show? That's, a, that's what I've heard people say that, but that wasn't the reason. It's kind of one of those kind of myths. Because I know a lot of people have said that too. It's actually just a really basic reason. During the English Civil War, Cromwell wanted to uniform his army in the same color. They found red fabric really cheap. <laughs> So red. <laughs> and they just stuck. And then the other countries kind of went from there. And so Washington said, you can't do it. And there's something else. Imagine walking down that path that Washington made, you know, about this big, two abreast, 1,200 men of pack animals. How long would that line be? With stragglers, it'd be five miles long. I'm not exaggerating. It would go on forever. Because you can't walk like shoulder to shoulder, you have to have space. Think how easy that would be to ambush up in the mountains. And that's what happened. Braddock's men got ambushed and destroyed on the Mahongahela River right here, right below Fort Duquesne. Just devastated. Over a third would be killed. They used those guerrilla tactics, hit and run. The French dress exactly like they're here on allies with the hair, and and it was a slaughter, and Braddock would be killed. 
Now, the battle was a big one for the British at the time, and it's not necessarily in context a huge one for our class, except for one reason. The British never adopted the right tactics. They never learned. They actually blamed Washington, who led a successful rear guard and saved two-thirds of the men. And so the British never adapted. When the Revolutionary War got to here, 1780s, guess who would do the same thing to the British? <coughs> Catch a Excuse me, Washington was up here, but the, the Continental Army, the U.S., the new United States, they turn around and do it to the British. And so now the United States has learned to never fall victim to a guerrilla army. That's my idea of a joke. Yeah, <laughs> so that's what we're doing special topics right now, the Vietnam War. Or Iraq, or Afghanistan. They're really hard to fight these types of armies. But, they... It really needs supplies, that's another story. But this is kind of big. So for two years, the French had their way. But then the war erupted in Europe. What's the French and Indian War going to be called in Europe when it started in 1756? Seven Years War. And so with that, now the French have to fight on their own borders. They have to fight in Europe. So they're preoccupied. And with the French preoccupied, what could the British do? Pick off French possessions all over the world. There's going to be huge fighting in India. Armies allied to the French, fighting armies allied to the British. Fights off of China, South Africa, the Mediterranean, the Caribbean, and of course here. And the tide completely turned. For another reason too, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, now do not think in terms of the President, even though they have the same functions. They're not the same. Britain has a parliamentary system. I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But don't think of this as a prime as a as the president. They're a member of parliament too. But they're getting more and more power. The king is losing power too. By the 19th century, the prime minister is more like the executive of the country. Who's prime minister of today? Who? That's Canada. And I'm Can and Canadians I don't like to be called right now. Even they saw the queen on who? Someone said. Yeah, Theresa May, who's exceedingly unpopular. It seems like every every place in the world, everybody's executive is really unpopular. Every place. Can't know they like Trudeau in Canada. No place else. <laughs> it seems like. But the prime minister is a man by the name of William Pitt. And Pitt reorganized the country. And the big thing is finances. A way to better finance the war, a better way to finance the debt. Because what they did is they began to borrow money like mad. And we're coming to a point that's going to come time after time in history. Governments have to borrow money all the time. How do governments borrow money? What do they call those things they issue? They issue something to borrow money. You might know what they do, what it's called. For example, when the school district, which is part of the government, um, passed uh, last, last year they passed a, a bill, or the voters voted for a bill to build new schools. That means they had to issue, what, anyone know? No. A levy is actually the tax, but to, you're on the right track. I know there's so many names for things. Why not? They, they actually didn't really raise taxes directly. It's more complex. Yeah. A bond. That's it. I know you start getting these names. They really do start blending together. But bonds. And literally, governments sell bonds. And what a bond is, for example, with the school district, it was a 20-year bond. But the idea is people would buy a bond, and the bond would be, say a certain amount on it. And in 20 years, it's what they call mature. And they, so you have this piece of paper that says it's basically an IOU. And you hold on to it. It's worth something. And then in 20 years, you give it back to the government, and they will pay you back the money plus what? Someone said it, interest. So you get a little bit extra. So it's a way that government can borrow money. You have to convince people to do it, so they give a little extra. Bonds, if the government is safe, secure, and always pays back their debt, it's, it's a very safe investment. It's secure. It's called a security. You put your money in that, you know it's safe. And then you can sell those bonds. That's another market altogether. Well, here's the thing. 
Britain started borrowing money like mad. Basically what Pitt said is, the hell with how much money we owe now, we have to win the war. And we're going to make sure we have enough money to win the war. Our Navy will be powerful. We're going to win the war. When the war is over, then we pay back. And so that's what he did. But the problem is this. When countries borrow more and more money, eventually people, potential investors who will buy these bonds, begin to look at it and think, wait a second. What if they don't pay these bonds back? Do I really want to buy a bond? What if they borrow too much money and they run out of money? What if they lose the war? Then what do you have? The bond becomes what? Just a worthless piece of paper. Would you buy the bond for somebody who might lose? So they say, oh, you won't buy it? We'll give you more interest. We'll give you more back. We'll give you more back. They raise the rate they'll give you for interest. And that's what was happening to the bridge. They're paying it back. They're, or, I mean, they're, they're buying these bonds. They pledge to pay it back, but they're having to, or they're char they're, uh, having to give greater and greater interest. That means they're going to owe more money down the road. You see the problem for rent. Pitt is going to engineer the finances to win the war. But when the war is over, what do they have to do? Or they'll be paying such sky high interest or break the bank. What do they have to do? Hmm? Pay the people back. Pay them back. Get it done. Right now. Doesn't that fit in exactly with all those taxes they paid on the colonies? That's coming. By the way, what's US government bonds called? They're not called. The generic name is bonds, but they have a different name for them. Hmm? I heard a couple things. What? A million, I know that's another that's another tax. I know one of those silly names. That, there's all these names for these programs. You might have heard them called T bills, or they're called Treasury bills, and that's U.S. government bills. And since since it's hit, um, since 1790, the United States has always paid back their debt, and so the, we actually have really really low interest on bonds on Treasury bills, shockingly low. If all of a sudden the U.S. government becomes more unstable, we're going through an interesting time. You guys are going to have a lot of fun. You, you're seeing so much. But where people think the U.S. won't pay it back its debt, then it could nature for its fault, and that could really hurt the economy. Right now, the U.S., everyone knows U.S. government bonds, they're safe. The safest investment in the world. They really are. The safest investment in the world. That's how come. We can have $19 trillion in debt, and people are still more than willing to buy U.S. government bonds. That's, that's just showing you. If all of a sudden they say they don't want it, then we'll see. <laughs> we'll come down the road to that later. So, back to this. They begin to organize it, and it worked. Within two years, the French began to pull back on all their victories they had. In fact, Duquesne, in 1758, they had to blow it up. They blew up the stockades with gunpowder. They had to abandon it. And the British rolled in and they took it. And they built their own fort, called it Fort Pitt. And of course, what town would form around it? Pretty clear. And so with that, yes, it's Pittsburgh. And so with that, and so now by 1759, everything had changed. The British were actually doing pretty well on the continent. But they have lost a huge battle in India, and now we're coming to the most important battle for the American Revolution, arguably. And it happened before, and not in what's going to be the United States. Kind of weird, isn't it? A battle that could have so much impact on what's going to become of these 13 colonies and now our nation. And it will happen up here in Quebec. We'll see this again in the 20th century, World War I and World War II. It will be decided much of what happened before the U.S. ever entered the war. So it's kind of one of these weird quirks. What happened was in 1759, the British decided to sail up the St. Lawrence and take Quebec. So everybody write down 1759, Quebec. The capital of New France, Quebec. Can you imagine how hard it would be to sail ocean-going vessels up a fast-moving river? You have to put little tacks. 
And sometimes you have to get men to get out in these big rowboats, rowboats called what whale boats, and row and pull the boats. Can you imagine how awful that would be? They did. In fact, their navigator was a guy um, who would eventually become one of the most famous captains in the Royal Navy, Captain William Cook. Some of you might have heard that name before. He would, after this, would explore the Pacific for the British. He would discover the Sandwich Islands. What do we call the Sandwich Islands? Huh? Yeah, Hawaii. Sandwich Islands would become the Hawaiian Islands. Hawaii's a good name, but it's hard not to like a name called Sandwich, right? Okay, so they sailed up the river. And here's the other thing. I don't know if you know this, but Canada can get cold. That might be on the test. So, and it's also the time of the mini ice age. Some of you might have heard of this. The mini ice age that would end in the 1810s. So it's a little bit colder too. And so they have, what, maybe two and a half months? And if the British Army, and they're going to say four, over 4,000 troops on these ships, or 50 ships, if they get marooned in winter hits, what's going to happen to them? And if they're done, they can't win. What if another one of those status quo anti bellum treaties was signed? If New France would have survived this, Quebec would have survived, all the events that led to the American Revolution would not have happened. There would be no lessons in the Congo. There would be no declaration of independence. The 13 bickering colonies would not have gotten together. There would be no United States as we know it. Our entire history would be different. The British have this limited time. And so to help you with this, i got a couple minutes. I'm going to show you this on a map I drew for you that puts on a transparency. And I did this because I care about you as people. Yeah. Now, it's not that they're going to get me with a tape measure. Okay. Where were you the night? I'm October 14th. See, this? see how that works? All right. This is how you interrogate. Can you see now? Yeah. <laughs> oh, you see the red, a red, a white dot? <laughs> All right, you notice how I drew this map for you? And i tell you what, it wasn't easy. You know the hardest part about drawing a map like this? Getting these letters exactly square. <laughs> but I don't like to brag, but I am a natural born cut And so I know you probably can't match this. Don't feel bad, don't be jealous. Well, that's why they want us to take a little pitch for us. But, Here's the St. Lawrence River. Actually, the current's going this way. The British fleet's coming down here. Here's Quebec on high cliffs. Here's the uh, St. Charles River, and it's really swampy here. If the British will land here, they get bogged down in the swamps. They can't get across the river. It's too deep to cross. So their commanding general, who's going to be one of the most famous, is he's a hero of the British military, Jonathan Wolfe. Woof. Wolf. Wolf convinced the Royal Navy to do something quite radical. They sailed past the fortified city of Quebec, which is on cliffs. It's about 50 feet high and goes as high as 100 feet down here. Sheer cliffs. Woof. Went past this. That kind of hurt. <laughs> but where do you land? And the problem was by the end of August, winter is coming. He doesn't know what to do. So, he lands right here below about 70 foot cliffs, now called Wolf's Cove. And he basically the 4,000 men got out of the boats, and they were quite happy about that. But still, we're looking up at these cliffs. Well, they noticed something. Oh, I gotta tell you one thing, it just makes me laugh so hard. I don't know why, it just cracks me up. French soldiers would go to the edge of the cliffs, 70 feet over the British soldiers. So imagine them up there, and what would they do? Yell insults. For some reason, that just makes me laugh. <laughs> they get there and call them names in French. But they noticed French women were coming down the cliff from a little village there and somehow made it down the cliff and washing clothes in the river and getting back up. They couldn't figure out how they were doing it. They just looked sheer. Well, two British pickets saw what looked like women they, they had um, hit out. It looked like women were floating down in the morning fog. What were they? 
Right? So these witches, no, they're coming down, they washed, and then when they came up, when they went back up, they walked over and they couldn't see it, though you're literally standing next to it. It was a little tiny trail made by mountain goats, about a foot wide that kind of switched back its way up the cliff. You couldn't see it unless you were literally on it. Wolf heard about it, and the next night he sent 4,500 men up that trail. Now, I always think about that. Think about guys with their gear going up a foot in dark. You think you put ropes or torches on it, but still. So I think about, you know, this is a side of cliff, just kind of And they went up, and then they put set little pulleys up and pulled up the horses in the camp. The French were not ready for this at all. And out of the blue, that next morning, here is 45, well, actually about 4,200, British soldiers sitting right here. They weren't supposed to be there. Yeah, we'll go to the left finish tomorrow, and then we want to do a test. So there'll be no quiz tomorrow, I promise. Unless I'm unless I'm angry. For those of you who skipped, were you here? And then or try to assassinate me. I did give a little bit more. I'm not. I'm not going to give you for uh, I'm not going to have a rip small. I'm going to give you one more day to read, but I have to have the other textbook that's in People's History. Chapter 4 is a really short chapter that is coincides directly with it. So read chapter 4 and do questions 2 and 3. I'll leave it on the board, not be going by. I think it's 9 pages. Huh? It could be the Russians. And I put up there, I put up the old Soviet fly. You figured they would be my friends, but no, nope, they're now. They Putin was an old uh, KGB agent. Did that tell you guys a Putin story about what he did? Was this when the Berlin Wall fell? It was when Reagan went to, President Reagan went to the Kremlin in, in 86. Where did I start? Uh, oh, I didn't tell you that story. I've heard some other stories, but oh yeah, Putin's good guy. No, no, even better. Let's put it. Let's put it. That's a bad spot right here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, good. President Trump has a thing for generals. I think because they've been conditioned to obey. By the way, they just went on film. I forgot to shut it off. Yeah, I meant it. Mm -hmm. Shake a bear is on film. All right. 